Our Father in heaven, Lord, we do love you, Lord, and we thank you, Lord, for your great love for us. Thank you, Lord, for getting us here tonight. We know, Lord, the struggles, they're, they're stay home or do other things, Lord God, but you brought us here into your house, Lord God, because I believe that you have a word for us. I believe again that if we've come tonight with an open heart, Lord, we will receive from you, Lord. Your Holy Spirit will speak and, and challenge and convict and correct and do whatever it is, Lord God, that we need as individuals. Lord, that's why we've come, Lord God, not for someone else, but we've come, Lord, because we need you personally. And we pray tonight, Lord, as we open up our Bibles, Lord, open up our hearts, speak to us, challenge us, do the work that only you can do, Lord. We love you. We ask for your blessing now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good evening once again. If you have a Bible, which I hope you do, let's turn to Hosea chapter 2. Okay? Hosea chapter 2. Remember, this is the book following the book of Daniel in the Old Testament. And so Hosea chapter 2, again, we're going to pick it right up where we left off again as we continue. Again, if you were... With us last week, we, we opened up the book. Again, I gave you a thorough introduction, and one of the first things I shared is that this is the first of the minor prophets, okay? And I shared the distinction between major prophets, right, and minor prophets. And, and the distinction is not the importance. The distinction is only the brevity or length of the book. And so I, I said that because I wanted you to understand that as we now turn to the minor prophets, they are just as important as the major prophets, okay? And specifically, the book of Hosea is a very important book, okay? I'm going to touch on just a few things again for the sake of time, things that in case you weren't here, you need to know before we go on. The first thing is I shared with you that the book of Hosea is a love story, and I love that, okay? It is a love story. Scholars liken the book of Hosea to the book of John in the New Testament, just as Daniel is, is what Revelation is, right, to the Old Testament. Hosea is what John is to the Old Testament. It's a love story, and it reveals the love that God has for his people, unlike any other book in the Old Testament. And so it literally is all about God's great love for us. But anyone who knows love stories knows that before you get to, and they lived happily ever after, there's always heartbreak in the middle. Isn't that right? There's always heartbreak with every, any, with every and any love story. And that's exactly what we find in the book of Hosea. It will end with, and they lived happily ever after, because we know that if you're a child of God, right, Israel or Christian, it'll all end happily ever after with us. Amen? Amen? But in the middle, now, let me ask you, are the Jews living happily ever after? No. Not today, okay? Because they are living in fulfillment of what we read in the book of Hosea. Now remember, from the very beginning, from the very, very beginning, right, God has always loved his people. And we know that God is love. God is a loving God. And one of the interesting lessons that we found in the book of Exodus, right, is when they met with God at Mount Sinai. Remember what God did. The Israelites were slaves in Egypt, right? God freed them from bondage. And the first place God took them was where? Mount Sinai. Why? What happened at Mount Sinai? Well, something very beautiful happened. At Mount Sinai, God agreed to be their God if they would agree to be his people. Remember that? Very, very important. At Mount Sinai, the first generation of Israelites, freed from Egypt, entered into a covenant. It was an agreement. God, you will be our God. We will be your people. And what's so beautiful about that covenant is that it is a picture of a marriage covenant. When Israel said, we will be your people, you will be our God, they became married to God. And all throughout the Old Testament, we read that Israel, the people of Israel, the nation of Israel, is the wife of God. Okay, never forget that. They are the wife of God. Now, understand that in every marriage, one of the things that is expected in every marriage, hopefully you would agree with me 100%, is faithfulness and loyalty. Can you married couples say amen to that? Right? This is key. This is foundational. 
And from the beginning, God has always remained faithful to his wife, to Israel. God is a good God. He's a faithful God. But sadly, as we know the history of the the Jewish people, as we read the Old Testament, over and over again, they broke the heart of their husband. Over and over again, they broke the heart of God as they were tempted by the ungodly world around them. And they engaged They became spiritually unfaithful. They became spiritual adulterers. And this is what the Bible reveals. Again, this is what the Bible teaches. They compromised with the ungodly world. They joined in with the ungodly practices of the world around them. They bowed down and worshipped the false gods that the Canaanite people specifically worshipped all around them. And every time they did, they broke the heart of God. And we can understand that. If you're married, especially, you can understand that. Every time they were unfaithful to their husband, they broke the heart of the one true God. And so what did God do? What is the lesson we've seen over and over and over again? Is that every time Israel went astray, God sent a prophet. Okay? God sent a prophet. What did that prophet do? The Old Testament is filled with prophets. The Old Testament called them. To return back to their God. And get that picture. The Old Testament showed prophets calling them. Go back to your husband. Go back to your faithful husband. He's been faithful to you. This is the picture. A beautiful picture you always want to have in your mind when you consider the prophets. That's what they were doing. After they told the people to come back to their God. Back to their husband. They always warned them. That if they did not. If they continue In their sin, if they continue to be adulterers, there would be consequences. There would be consequences. Now, Hosea, I shared last week, was the last of the prophets that God sent to the northern kingdom. I shared with you the difference between the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom last week in the introduction. First, God sent Elijah, and then God sent Elisha, and then God sent Amos, and lastly, God sent Hosea. He's the last one. He was their last chance. That's the way you need to see it. Now, what had happened? God sent prophets. God sent prophets. God sent prophets. But eventually, the people tuned out the prophets. You guys with me? They became deaf, just like so many people, again, that hear the word of God today. They've heard God's call. They've heard God's, again, command to turn from their sins, to repent. But they've heard it so much, they they don't even hear it no more. They've tuned God out. They become deaf, spiritually deaf. And for that reason, God had to do something different. And that's what he did with Hosea. He commanded him to do something different, something that they would notice. They might not hear it, but they would see it with their eyes. You guys remember what God commanded Hosea to do? God commanded Hosea to marry a prostitute. Wow. A holy man of God, a godly man, he commanded him to marry a prostitute. Why? Because he wanted the nation of Israel to see what he saw. He wanted the whole nation to understand what their marriage to God looked like. They were married to a faithful, godly man, a godly husband, right? But they were adulterers. Just like this prostitute, having prostituted themselves, again, with the ungodly people in this world. Hosea obeyed. We read that last week. He married a woman by the name of Gomer. Okay, what a name, right? Gomer. And why did he do this? He did this because, number one, out of obedience to God, amen? And number two, because he understood what God was doing wanting to do. God was going to use his life, his marriage, his relationship with a prostitute as an object lesson. The people weren't listening. They would see it now. They would see what it looked like, okay? And that's where we're going to pick up. That's where we're literally, again, we pick up the story. Now, what's so awesome about God is that God had every right just to give his wife the boot. Isn't that right? He had every right. They didn't deserve it. We don't deserve him. He had every right to cut them loose, to let them go. She had been unfaithful. Israel had been unfaithful. 
But the amazing love of God teaches us that God is faithful even to his unfaithful people. Write that down. God is always faithful to his unfaithful people. So instead of just cutting her loose and getting rid of her, God doesn't give up on his kids. So what does God do? This is what chapter 2 is all about. God calls on Israel to repent. And he does this by calling Israel out on three, write that down, three types of sins that she was guilty of committing. Okay, That's what we're going to look at tonight. Three different types of sins God calls them out on that Israel was guilty of committing. Now, when God calls us out on our sin, he's not doing it just to judge us. He's not doing it to condemn us, right? Hopefully, if we share with someone that they're in sin, we're not doing it to put a finger in their face, but we're doing it, why? Because we love them. Because we want them to see what we see. We want them to turn from the error of their ways. We want them to repent of their sins. Why? Because if they don't, what happens? For the wages of sin is death. That's what this is all about. Again, I love it. I'll say it again. God could have just cut them loose, could have let them go. That's what they deserved. But God is so good. Instead of giving up on them, he's going to use Hosea again to expose these three different types of sins that Israel was guilty of committing. If you're taking notes, again, I've titled tonight's message, The Charges Against an Unfaithful Wife. Write that down. The Charges Against an Unfaithful Wife. Again, we're going to look at three types of sins that Israel, and remember, Israel is illustrated by Gomer, that they were both guilty of. The first thing, the first sin they're guilty of is idolatry. We would call this spiritual adultery. Look at verse 2 as we pick up where we left off. Remember, we covered verse 1 at the end of last week. Again, it says this. Plead, Hosea says. Remember, he's speaking on behalf of God. Plead with your mother. Plead, for she is not my wife, and I am not her Husband, Hosea here is speaking on behalf of God. Who's he speaking to? He's speaking to the children of Israel. And he's telling them, speak to your mother, speak to the nation. Because the nation as a whole is in sin. The nation as a whole is guilty. And Hosea is calling, I love this, it's very practical, on the individual citizens of Israel the individual people to repent, to take a stand, to do what is right, and to call the nation, call the mother, call Israel, again, to repent of her spiritual adultery. Now understand that in a marriage relationship, right? A marriage relationship is sacred, isn't that right? Having been joined by God, let no man separate, the Bible says. But adultery is something that breaks that holy union. Isn't that right? Adultery. That's what breaks it. Being unfaithful breaks that covenant. Now, Israel had been unfaithful. They had committed spiritual adultery. And because they've done that, they broke the relationship they had with God. Which is why God says what he says. You're not my wife. Right? God could have said, my wife wouldn't do that to me. You're not my wife, and I am not your husband. What you did broke our relationship. What you did severed our marriage union. This is what God was saying. Again, at this point, God could have said, I'm done with you, right? Remember, in the Old Testament, the penalty for adultery, you guys remember what it was? Stoning to death. If your spouse cheated on you, they were stoned to death, and now you are free. Isn't that right? Because they're dead. That's the way it worked. You were free. God had every right again just to cut them loose, to allow them to suffer the wages of sin, which is death. But instead, God didn't do that. He calls upon the individual Israelites, whoever's willing to listen, 
to rebuke the nation, to stand up, we would say, and say something. Because God did not want to give up on his unfaithful wife. And he desired that the nation as a whole would turn from their sin. Let me ask you, how many of you want our nation as a whole to turn from our sin? Right? We are individuals in this country that should be standing for what is right. That should be living and being right when the whole world is living wrong. And we have have a responsibility, right? Right? to say something, to stand up, to take a stand, to say what's going on in this nation is wrong and we better repent before we face the judgment of God. Again, it's the same exact picture. Now what's incredible as we look at these three different charges is what you need to imagine is a courtroom, okay? A courtroom. Hosea acts as a prosecuting attorney On behalf of the plaintiff. Who's the plaintiff? God, the husband. He has been wronged, hasn't he? And Hosea is going to declare three separate charges of unfaithfulness to God's wife, the defendant, Israel. That's what this is. It's actually a very beautiful picture that God gives us. The first charge that she's guilty of is spiritual adultery. She had prostituted herself with the other gods of the world. Look what it said. Keep reading. Plead with your mother that she put away her whoring from her face and her adultery from between her breasts. One of the things that was taking place specifically, you can write this down, look it up later. First Kings Book of 1 Kings, chapter 18 and 19, okay? In those chapters, you find the history of what was taking place. You got a lot more detail in those chapters. One of the things the Israelites were guilty of doing was worshiping the false gods that the Canaanite people around them were worshiping. Specifically, when things got bad during times of drought, during times of famine, The ungodly nations, what they would do is they would begin to cry out to their gods. Cry out to their gods to send rain. Cry out to their gods for their crops to grow. And they would specifically cry out to a specific Canaanite god known as Baal. Have you heard that name before? B-A-A-L, Baal. He was believed to be, by the Canaanites, the god of weather and agriculture. And so during times of drought, during times of famine, they would worship Baal. They would cry out to Baal. They would plead for Baal to send the rain. And they believed again, he was the God of the rain, the God of the weather that could do this. You might remember that the way that they would worship Baal is they would have orgies. Okay? I know we're in church, but this is history. Okay? And they would worship Baal as they would participate with prostitutes, both male and female, in their pagan rituals. Again, this is history. This is what took place. Now get this. The Israelites were involved in their sin, the sin of their ungodly neighbors. The right thing to do, I think you'll agree with me, during times of famine, during times of drought, would be to what? To recognize that they had sinned against God and to cry out to God for his mercy. Would you agree with that? That's what they should have done. But how many times have people, even today, because they don't want to stop sinning, instead of crying out to God for help and asking God for his mercy, they turn to other alternatives to help them with their problems. We see the same thing happening today? We see it. It's all over. It's the same thing. The Israelites, instead of going to their God, the one true God, turning from their sins, saying, God, we're sorry. We understand you're allowing the drought because of what we've done. They didn't do that. Instead, they said, you know what? We'll pray to Baal. They worship Baal. They participated in the orgies, crying out to Baal, because that way they could continue in their sin. Asking Baal again to provide the rain. 
This was spiritual adultery, okay? They were engaging themselves with false gods, which is why Hosea commanded people to say something, right? Any individuals out there that love God, that want to serve God, say something, take a stand. Let the nation know that they were in sin. Stand up for what is right. Now what God's going to do through Hosea is warn the Israelites. You're guilty of spiritual adultery. You're guilty. If you do not repent, this is what I'm going to do to you. Okay? And that's what we read next. Look at verse 3. Three things God will do to them. Number one, lest I strip her naked and make her as in the day she was born. Let me put it this way because sometimes it's just easier, again, in simple language. God says, you like being naked? You like being a prostitute? I'll make you like a prostitute. That's what God says. I will strip you naked and make you as in the day you were born. Remember, newborn babes, they are born what? Naked. Do they have anything to their name? No, they have nothing. God says, that's what you want? You want to be naked? I'll give you what you want. You want to act like a prostitute? I'll treat you like a prostitute. And then I will shame you. I will shame you for your sin. I will expose you for your sin, stripping you naked, reducing you to nothing. How many of you know sin has a way of reducing us to nothing? And that's what God said. That's what you want, he says. I'll give it to you. I'll give you the sin you want. Strip you. Allow you to be reduced so that you will be like a baby. You'll have nothing to your name. And you'll be crying out for help. You'll be crying out for someone again to help you. It's the first thing God said. That's a pretty scary warning, right? How we need to be careful about the sin we want to engage in before God just gives us completely over to that sin. Look what God says. Keep reading. And make her like a wilderness and make her like a parched land and kill her with thirst. Not only did God say that he would strip her, Israel, for, with, with everything they had, but the second warning God gave was because of their idolatry with Baal. Remember, they worshiped Baal believing that he would provide for them the rain. And so what did God say? Oh, okay, you don't want to come to me, huh? You want to go to Baal? Well, I will make you like a desert, God says. God says, I'm the one who is in charge of the rain, okay? I'm the one who's in control of the rain. You don't want to come to me? Fine, God says. I will take everything from you, and I will allow you to die of thirst, God says. I will withhold the rain because there is nothing, right, that Baal or any of the false gods of the world can do for you. Oh, Lord, again, how he has a way of getting our attention, right? This was the message. God wasn't playing around. God was telling them, if you do not turn from your sin, if you do not stop worshiping the false gods of the world, your life will become a drought. Your life will become a parched land. I will hold back the rain, God says, and I will teach you who really is in control. Let's look at the third thing, verse 4. He says, upon her children, the children of Israel and their children's children, also I will have no mercy. This is the third warning God made. Because they are children of whoredom, for their mother has played the whore. She who conceived them has acted shamefully. The third warning God gave to the nation is that because they were living like prostitutes, they were producing children from their prostitution. I'll say it another way. Any parent that is leading an ungodly life is likely producing ungodly children. Is that right? I'll say it again if I didn't say it right. Any parent who is living an ungodly life 
it's more than likely producing an ungodly child. And that's exactly what was happening. God says, you're producing children that are just like you. And for that reason, I will extend no mercy to them because they will not be my kids. That's what God says. Now, this is scary to me because God is saying, I will withhold my mercy upon them. And if God withholds his mercy from any of us, we are in trouble because the only thing that we have coming is judgment. And the most terrible thing about this as a parent and a grandparent is I want my kids to be blessed. And blessing only comes with serving Jesus. Apart from God, right? I don't care if my kids win the lotto, right? Become doctors or lawyers or scientists or astronauts. If they end up in hell, what did it matter? What did it matter? And God was telling the parents, because of your sin, your kids are going to be just like you and it'll be partially your fault. Because instead of influence them, influencing them with your godly example, you influence them to be just like you. And then they're going to suffer for it and it's going to be partially your fault. Hopefully you understand from these three warnings that God takes faithfulness pretty serious. Would you agree? Right? God takes faithfulness pretty serious. Well, let me ask you again, because I think this is practical. Should that surprise us that God takes faithfulness serious? Doesn't every spouse expect their spouse to be faithful? Would you agree with that, right? Now, you might be here and you might be thinking, well, wait a minute. Well, come on, pastor. I'm pretty faithful to God. I mean, I'm not faithful all the time, but I'm faithful most of the time. How would you feel if your wife told you that? <laughs> well, honey, I'm faithful to you 90% of the time. Would that be good enough? Would that work for you? You tell me. Is that good enough? It's 100% or nothing, right? It's the way it needs to be. Again, we, we can agree with that. I don't think God's being unreasonable. I don't think God is being unfair. A lot of people say, well, God, you're not fair. You expect us to have no fun. Oh, we better understand, we serve a good God and a loving God and a merciful God, but it is a privilege to serve the Lord. It is a privilege to be married to God, right? It's a privilege to be called the bride of Christ. That is a privilege. If you are here and you are a Christian, I don't, let me just make something clear. I don't assume everyone in here is a Christian. I never do. Okay, I don't know your heart. You don't know my heart. I don't just assume that everyone who comes to church is a Christian. So I'll say it this way. If you are a child of God, right? If you are a child of God, that means that you have entered into a relationship with God by faith alone in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. If you have entered into that relationship, you are a part of the church, which is known as the bride of Christ, which means that you too are married to God, just like the Israelites were married to God. And if you're married to God, God expects 100% faithfulness. And we need to understand, again, God is not being unreasonable in expecting that. What this tells us is that we, and I'm speaking to us, better be careful about being unfaithful and thinking it's okay. Again, I'll say it, you know, to make it so simple, you know, if your wife thought it was okay to be unfaithful, how would you feel? Or vice versa, your husband. There's no way that would be acceptable. And so we have to understand that what God expects makes sense. It is reasonable, which is why, again, the Bible teaches us a couple things. If you're taking notes, which I hope you are, write these things down. Number one, the Bible, again, speaking to believers, tells us not to love the things of this world. Do we understand that? Not to love the things of this world. 1 John 2, 15 and 16. Do not, I mean, it can't be made any more simple than this. Love the things of this world or the things in this world. 
If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not inside him. Remember, you're either going to love God or you're going to love the world. You can't love both. You can't. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is of this world. We need to wrap our heads around this, guys, okay? We can't play both sides. We can't love the world and engage, be in part of the world and engage with the world and call ourselves Christians at the same time. It doesn't work that way. Number two, we are not to even be friends with the world. You guys know that? James 4.4, he says, you adulterers, you adulterers, you spiritual adulterers, don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? Whose side are we on? I say it again, if you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. Now that's pretty heavy duty stuff, but that's Bible, guys, okay? That's Bible. Number one, we're not supposed to love the world or the things in the world. Number two, we're not to try to be friends with the world or friendly with the world. Number three, we are to keep ourselves unstained by the filth and the garbage and the sin of this world. James 1.27, we are to keep oneself unstained. Your Bible might say unspotted by the world. How many of you know, again, the world wants us to... Roll in the mud with it, right? We're not supposed to do that. We're new. At one time, we might have been pigs living in the mud. Isn't that right? But we're new creatures in Christ. We don't belong there anymore. Last one. We are not to be conformed by this world. How many of you know the world wants to make, right, copies, right? Wants everyone to be like everyone else. Paul tells us, don't be conformed, right? Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think, okay? These four things, again, as believers, we need to practice. Otherwise, if we fall in love with the world or are friendly with the world, right? If we allow ourselves to be stained by this world or conform to this world, we will be adulterers will be adulterers again and will reap the consequences. Let's look at the second type of sin that the nation of Israel was guilty of, which is the sin of ingratitude, okay? Very important, again, the sin of ingratitude. Keep reading. For she said, this is speaking again, symbolically of the nation of Israel, I will go after my lovers who give me my bread and my water, my wool and my flax, my oil and my drink. God saw the nation of Israel foolishly thinking that she would find what she needed in the things of this world. Isn't that something we all struggle with today, right? Oh, if I only had this, I'd be happy. If I could only do that, I'd be happy, right? Right? That's a lie. Forgetting, again, that we will truly only find fulfillment when we're in a right relationship with the one who loves us and created us. That's where satisfaction comes. I love our God because he made us. He knows how we tick, doesn't he? He knows what makes us tick. I'll put it that way. But for anyone to foolishly think, man, the world has what I need. The alcohol or the drugs or the women or the men or whatever it is. That's what I need. That's what will fulfill me. That's what will make me happy. That's what Israel was thinking. Going after again her lovers, right? These false things, these false gods. Thinking, foolishly thinking that her lovers are the ones that would provide for her needs. Her lovers were the ones that would bring satisfaction to her life. But let me ask you. Who's the one that really would fulfill their needs? Their God, their husband, okay? Their God and their husband. Interesting, if you're taking notes, it's kind of interesting stuff. The use of the words bread and water refer to the physical needs that everyone has. Wool and flax were garments, there were blankets, there were coverings, symbolized protection. And oil and drink symbolized pleasure or luxuries. 
all of these things that people try to find from the things of the world. And that's what the Israelites were doing. They were going to the Baals, right? These false gods for crops, for rain, for money again, for all these things that were going after them, God says, like a woman going after her lover. And God wanted them to know there's nothing there. They can provide nothing for you. How many of you, again, and I think this is so simple, how many of us, again, prior to Jesus in our BC days, right, we'd look to find satisfaction anywhere, right? Going to after parties, after parties. You guys with me, right? Nothing. If we found something, we would probably still be doing it. Isn't that right? I remember that, again, years ago... uh, you know, partying with my friends and then coming to the Lord and then, you know, them cutting me off because I didn't want to party with them anymore and eventually running into them years later and asking me, hey, man, you still going to church, right? You still serving Jesus? You know, they were trying to make a joke out of it. And I told them, yeah, man, everything you did, I did. But I found something better. Had what we've been doing been better than Jesus, I'd still be doing it with you guys. That should have told you something. And that's what God wanted them to know. Again, how foolish they were, right? Thinking that they could find fulfillment in the gods and the things of this world that can never satisfy. So to teach them a lesson, God's all about teaching lessons, to help the Israelites understand who was the one who had always truly provided for them so that they would learn to appreciate their husband, the Lord declared in verse 6, Therefore, In other words, because you've been trying to find fulfillment in your false gods, therefore, I will hedge. If you have a pen, underline that word hedge. Very important. Therefore, I will hedge up her way with thorns, and I will build a wall against her so that she cannot find her paths. She shall pursue her lovers, notice, but not overtake them. She shall seek them, but shall not find them. This is so interesting and it is so beautiful. Let me, let me explain it to you. How many of you were with us when we covered the book of Job? You guys remember that? Most of us, I think, I'm sure we're there. Book of Job, we read an interesting story. Job was a godly man, right? Blameless, upright before God. We read that Satan tried to tempt him to sin, right? Was unsuccessful, we know that. What does Satan do? Satan then comes before God in heaven, right? Job chapter 1, and what happens? God says this. Job chapter 1, verse 8. The Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? Remember, of course, God knew that. God knew what Satan had been up to, and he's basically teasing Satan because Satan couldn't get Job to sin against God. He says, have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil? Verse 9, then Satan answered the Lord and said, does Job fear God for no reason? Notice verse 10, here's the key. Have you not put a what? A hedge around him, his house, and all that he has on every side. You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. Now, I show you this because this is a very beautiful lesson for all of us that should comfort us. And that lesson is that God puts a hedge around his children. How many of you say amen to that, right? That's a hedge, and this is beautiful. What is a hedge? We know what a hedge is, right? It's a beautiful picture. It's a wall. It's a barrier. It's a boundary. Now get this. This hedge works in two ways, and this is what you've got to learn tonight. Number one, the hedge protects us from the attacks of the enemy coming from the outside. You can write that down, okay? That's what happened in this case, right? That hedge protected Job from Satan, So that nothing could happen to Job, right? No harm from Satan could happen to him until God allowed it. And so number one, that hedge protects us from attacks on the outside. But then, the hedge also protects us on the inside. 
This is interesting. It protects us on the inside. How does it do that? Well, it keeps God's children, it keeps us from being able to go and find fulfillment in the things of this world. How many of you, and this is so incredible because it's so simple, how many of you have experienced the fact that we struggle with temptation every day? Right? Are we still sinners? We're still sinners. We are forgiven, praise the Lord, right? We're made right with God through our faith in Christ. But we're still sinners. We're still sinners and we will continue struggling with our sin until we get our new bodies, right? Until these, this old sinful nature is done with, it's done away with. We're going to consider, um, we're going to continue to, to struggle. We're, we're going to keep sinning and that's just part of it. God has made provision for our sin, right? If we confess our sin, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's 1 John 1, 9. God has made provision through the blood of Christ, right, to cover us when we sin. Now, God has placed this hedge of protection around us, again, to protect us from attacks from without, but to keep us in from going out and finding pleasure in the things of this world. We call this hedge the Holy Spirit. Isn't that right? It's the Holy Spirit. That's who it is. It's the Holy Spirit. Think about it. What happens when you are tempted to sin, right? And you start getting close to that line. You guys with me? You start getting close to that line, right? What happens? The Holy Spirit, the hedge says, ah, 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 right? What does he say? You can't do that no more. That's what he does. That's what he's there for. He's there to keep us in line, okay? He's there to keep us in line. Now, what happens if we don't listen to the Holy Spirit and we do it anyway? God's not going to, right? If we want to sin, he's going to let us sin. Sometimes, I honestly believe on a side note, God shuts it down and keeps us from sin. I believe that. But there are times when God will allow us to sin. But think about it. Don't raise your hand to this question. <laughs> How many times did you not listen, went ahead and did it anyways, but when you did it, you didn't enjoy it? You understand what I'm talking about? You can't enjoy it no more. You can't enjoy it no more. Now, let me be honest. Again, I'm, you might not hear this from anybody else, but I will tell you, sin is fun, okay? It is. I can't be up here and say, oh, you should never sin. It's, not, it's no fun, guys, right? I might work on three-year-olds or something, but again, the reality is it is fun. But if you are a child of God... If you are married to God and you understand who you are and what God has done for you, you're not the same anymore. You can't just go and sin and enjoy it like you once did. Why? God's not going to let you. God's not going to let you find satisfaction in this world apart from him. No way. And so every time you try to sin, if you are a child of God, I, wanna, I need to add that. Guess what? You're going to be miserable in your sin because God will not allow you to be happy without him. How many times, again, I don't want to ask you to raise your hand, but how many times, again, have you done something and you just felt like a bag of dirt, right? Right? Seriously, I don't know what you, whatever to, phrase to use, but you felt like, it, like crumbs, you know what I mean? What did I do? You can't even do it no more. I told you, I learned a long time ago a, a simple lesson. I always, I love to say this because I, it's so simple, but I learned a long time ago that since I can never, ever, ever be a good sinner again, I might as well be a good Christian, okay? I learned that a long time ago, and I, it's a lesson for children of God. If you truly are a child of God, you'll never be a good sinner anymore, okay? I told you, I can't go back to the nightclub and do the cabbage patch anymore. It ain't going to work, okay? It ain't going to work. It won't be fun like it used to be because I'm different. 
Because if any man be in Christ, right, or women, they're new creatures in Christ. They're changed. And that's what this whole thing is about. Any child of God who tries to go after sin, who tries to go after these things, God hedges them in. You can't go no more. You can't enjoy it no more. That's exactly what God was telling the Israelites. And you know what happens? Every time you sin, you hate it. And your sin becomes frustrating. You guys with me? It becomes frustrating. It's not even fun no more. Because it's so frustrating. But here's the good news. God wants you to be frustrated with your sin. Because when you come to the place that you're frustrated with your sin, guess what? That's when you'll turn back to God. That's what God does. Keep reading. Verse 7. Then, this is what's going to happen. She shall say, I will go and return to my first husband. For it was better for me then than now. And she did not know that it was I who gave her the grain, the oil, who lavished on her silver and gold, which they used for Baal. God knew that when the Israelites were miserable in their sin, they would come back. They would come back again to their husband. They would come back again to the one who has always been there for them, the one who has always provided for them. They would learn to appreciate their first husband, and they would return, and they would love him again. That's why God did this again. That's why God was going to punish them, make them frustrated, make them miserable, right, in their search for satisfaction. Verse 9, therefore I will take back, God says, my grain in its time and my wine in its season, and I will take away my wool and my flax, which were to cover her nakedness. God says you need to learn a lesson. I'm going to have to strip you of everything I've given you. Is that what it's going to take? That's what I'm going to do, God says. You will be miserable. I will cause you to be miserable and frustrated. And how many of you know if that's what God knows we need? Then so be it, okay? Then so be it. Remember, God cares more about our holiness than our happiness. Isn't that right? God cares more about you getting to heaven, right, than you having fun in this world. Seriously. And so should we. So should we. Now, this is an interesting lesson for us. Because, again, we too are married to God. We too have been blessed by God. Everything we have, right, has been given to us by God. So if we too want to use our bodies to sin against God, want to use our time to sin against God, right? Want to use our money to sin against God after he has given us all those things? Don't be surprised if he takes it all away, right? Don't be surprised if God takes it all away. Now, what I love about this, again, what I love about this is that all of us know someone in here who is wandering in the things of this world. Isn't that right? All of us. I'll say it another way. All of us in here know people who come to church who are wandering in the things of this world. Maybe that's even ourselves. You know what we should pray? God put a hedge around them, right? God put a hedge around my kids. God put a hedge around my grandkids, right? God put a hedge around my, around my neighbors, right? Make them miserable in their sin, so that they'll turn to you, so that they will turn to you again. I think that's such a, a practical lesson. Let's look at the last thing, and we're done tonight. Third sin, number one, again, was idolatry. Number two, ingratitude, ungratefulness for what God has given them. Number three, hypocrisy. Verse 10, now I will, if you have a pen, underline I will, uncover her lewdness in the sight of her lover's. And no one shall rescue her out of my hand. And I will, God says, underline that, put an end to all of her mirth, her feasts, her new moons, her Sabbaths, and all her appointed feasts. God already, again, was upset at their idolatry. 
God was already again upset at their ingratitude, and now he exposes them for committing hypocrisy. How many of you know God can't stand hypocrisy, right? God hates hypocrites. We have to remember what Jesus said. What did Jesus say? Book of Revelations, Revelation 3.15. I know all the things you do that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish, God says, that you were one or the other. Make up your mind. But since you are like lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth, Jesus says. Make up your mind. I don't like hypocrites, God says. But the Israelites were being hypocrites. You see, they were living in sin. They were worshiping these false gods. But you know what they were doing? When the Hebrew festivals came along, oh, they celebrated the Hebrew festivals, right? The holy days came along, they celebrated the holy days. They were hypocrites. Here they were celebrating the holy days, claiming to be God's children. When they were sinning, when they were committing spiritual adultery and they were worshiping the false gods of the Canaanites. And God says, "Uh uh-uh, you're a bunch of hypocrites and I'm going to expose your lewdness, he says. I'm going to expose you. I'm going to pull your covers. I'm going to take away all your blessings and I'm going to judge you for your sin." We all know that God is a good and patient God, right? He's a merciful God, but eventually God says what? That's it. I gave you time. I allowed you time to repent, opportunity to get right with me. And now you're done, God says. Now I have to do this to you. Verse 12, I will lay waste her vines and her fig trees on which she said, these are my wages, which my lovers have given me. I will make them a forest and the beasts of the field shall devour them. I will punish her for the feast days of the Baals when she burned offerings to them and adorned herself with her ring and jewelry and went after her lover's notice and forgot me, forgot me, declares the Lord. Now, one of the things I said earlier is that none of us can judge anyone else. Isn't that right? Because we really don't know each other's heart. But God does. Right? God knows the heart. And he will only tolerate half-heartedness for so long. Right? Eventually, God deals with it. Eventually, God has to expose the hypocrite. Now again, God is patient. I thank God for his long suffering the Bible describes. And so what does God do? God gives us time to learn from our mistakes, doesn't he? I thank God that he does that. He gives us time to learn from our mistakes and to turn from our sins. But eventually, if we want to continue in our sin and forget about the Lord, God has to allow us to learn the hard way. We have a choice tonight. We have a choice tonight. We can learn from God's word. Isn't that right? We can learn from the things that have been written to teach us about the consequences of sin. That's option number one. Option number two is we can allow our sin to be our teacher. None of us want that to happen, I guarantee you. None of us, again, want to have to suffer the consequences that our sin brings instead of learning the easy way, believing, trusting, obeying the word of God and not having to suffer the consequences. We pick it up next week, guys, as we read about what God commands Hosea to do next. Let's pray. Let's pray. Again, Father, we thank you for your word tonight, Lord God. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your mercy, Lord. We thank you for your patience. Oh, Lord, help us, Lord God, to read your word, Lord God, to understand your word, and then to examine our own lives, Lord, examine our hearts. Are we guilty of being prostitutes, Lord God, with the ungodly things of this world, involving ourselves in the sin of this world? Are we ungrateful for all that you've done for us? 
using all the things that you've given us, Lord God, to practice sin? Are we hypocrites? Help us, Lord, again, as you called the Israelites again to examine their lives so that they would see where they were guilty and turn from their sin and turn back to you. I pray we would do the same thing tonight, Lord God. Forgetting about everyone else and just just considering our own life, our own actions. Are we Christians in name only or are we truly those who strive to be faithful to our husband? Help us, Lord. Speak to us. Challenge us. Convict us where we need to be convicted. We thank you tonight, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand, guys. Amen. I love how practical the Word of God is. Amen. This applies to us. Anyone who says, I don't study the Old Testament, that doesn't apply to us. They're they're not reading the Old Testament because it's all practical. Again, everything that has been written here is written for us as the bride of Christ. So again, we could learn from the mistakes of Israel that we could learn again and grow and make better choices. And if we have found ourselves wandering off, again, we can acknowledge our sin. We could say, God, you're right. God, thank you, God, for exposing me, Lord God. Thank you for convicting me. I don't, I don't want to suffer like the children of Israel suffered. Lord, help me, Lord. Forgive me. Have mercy. Give me the strength to turn from my sin and to live for you, Lord, before it's too late, Lord. I pray that's our heart tonight. And so as always, again, we close with prayer, guys. Again, let the Lord minister to you. Don't just run out of this place, but spend time with Jesus. Again, share with him again what you've received from him. Let him know that you believe his word is truth and respond to it the way you know you need to. We'll sing a song, but if you need prayer again, guys, prayer team is here. Put your pride away again. Be honest and open with God. He knows anyways. Come and receive prayer if you need it. Let's sing. Let's sing.